Yeah, I mean, I'm gay. Um, I'm a lesbian. I never imagined that I could be gay because I was a good Christian and I loved Jesus. Like, I genuinely loved Jesus. This is Why I Stay, a show about faithfulness in the face of judgment, hurt, and betrayal. Bridget Eileen Rivera grew up thinking that all gay people went to hell, only to discover that she herself was gay. She planned on keeping that to herself forever until she was outed by a friend at her local church. And instead of responding with love and compassion, her church made her feel like a failure and a sinner, even though she'd always been celibate. Bridget has written a book called Heavy Burdens, Seven Ways LGBTQ Christians Experience Harm in the Church. It tells her story and describes the ways that her Christian community could have responded better. I wanted to know from Bridget why she still was committed to her faith, even though it cost her so much and made her an outsider to most communities. I grew up in a Reformed Baptist church, and I grew up in the homeschool evangelical movement. So I was homeschooled for most of my life from second grade all the way through high school. And I have seven siblings, which is, I guess, kind of the stereotype that homeschool families have just tons of kids. And I really, I had a very good childhood. All of my, me and my siblings were all very close And I went to a college specifically for homeschool evangelical students, Patrick Henry College, otherwise often referred to as God's Harvard. It's a tiny little college in Purcellville, Virginia. It has 300 students. Everybody knows each other. Uh, Highly, highly conservative. And um, overall, I had a very positive experience in the church growing up, a very positive experience developing my faith. My church that I was raised in, the Reformed Baptist Church, really gave me a solid understanding of theology. And at my college, I really developed some really good relationships that were very formative for me. So overall, I'm very grateful for how I was raised, my upbringing my background in the faith, and still find that I rely heavily on those foundations in thinking about my faith today. Growing up in that kind of culture, I'm sure that you heard a lot of jokes and implicit things about gay people, queer people. Mm -hmm. Yep. As you were growing up, what were the attitudes you picked up, both for you personally and the ones that you heard about the queer community, gay people, lesbians? Yeah, yeah. Um, So the message that I heard is one that I think was pretty typical at the time. I grew up in the 90s. And by that time, the kind of narrative about gay people was pretty solidified. Gay people rebel against God. And uh, it's a choice. They are choosing to engage in a sinful lifestyle. So being gay is a choice um, to rebel against God. And uh, um, God sent AIDS as a punishment for their sins. And they are unequivocally going to hell. And because I I grew up in a Reformed Baptist church, uh, the Reformed tradition is Calvinistic, Uh, So there is, you know, kind of this belief that things are predestined. And so I learned that um, God chose gay people to be vessels of his wrath and that this was just, you know, part of how things uh, were predestined before the beginning of time. And uh, therefore, they are inherently sinful and, and destined for hell. And that, that was the message that I heard, which honestly was not really that typical. I mean, it kind of sounds shocking and a little extreme saying it out loud, but honestly, it was not all that uncommon um, and still is a very common perspective. Um, I hear it still all the time. Um, I put, you know, a name to it. I see, I say it myself out loud. I'm always like, gosh, like that sounds so extreme, but um, it's a very, very common mentality and still is to this day. Okay. So you, you're growing up, uh, I assume you just assumed you were straight. Oh yeah, definitely. And that the struggle, any struggles you had, everybody had them. Yeah. <laughs> so did you, did you pick those, up those attitudes as well? Oh yeah, for sure. I never questioned 
those per, that perspective. I believed it 100% because I had no reason to question it. Um, it seemed, you know, reasonable to me and I didn't know otherwise. Um, it was the only thing that I was taught. And yeah, I never imagined that I could be gay because I was a good Christian and I loved Jesus. Like I genuinely loved Jesus, took my faith very seriously. So it never popped into my mind that this could be me, that, you know, all of these messages that I was internalizing about queer people, I was internalizing about myself, never, ever popped into my mind. When did this challenge or or this journey for you really start where you start looking in the mirror and going, oh, wait a minute, is that me? I guess the first time that I really started realizing, oh my gosh, I'm attracted to women was probably early on when I was in college because I finally started realizing that the girls around me were actually legitimately into the guys that they said Mm. they had crushes on. And for most of my life, when I said that I had a crush on a guy, it really meant nothing to me. I was just playing along with all the rest of them. And I assumed that all the rest of them, it was just kind of this like game that we were all playing at. And finally in college, I realized, no, like these girls around me actually have feelings for these guys. And I called my mom up. And I talked to her on the phone and I was like, okay, mom, can you just explain to me what a crush feels like? Because I honestly have no idea. It's like the kind of question that you can only ask your mom because it's Mm -hmm. super embarrassing to ask anybody else. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, she explained to me what a crush feels like. You get kind of butterflies in your stomach. You feel kind of hot. You know, you get this kind of giggly feeling and you just want to be around them all the time, but you're also scared to be around them. And like all of these different feelings that you feel when you have a crush. And that was for me the moment where I was like, oh my goodness, I definitely have felt that before, but not for a guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the moment where I started to realize that I had attractions for women. I did not use the word gay. I did not even allow myself to think the word gay, Mm -hmm. but that was when I started to realize and really start, I guess, wrestling with what this could mean for me. And it was a journey. Um, it, It was not easy for me to reconcile. Mm -hmm. Um, and like that was the beginning, but I definitely did not really start coming to terms with what that meant for me until years and years later. The stories that I hear often are people, particularly those who grew up in conservative homes, they they have this internalized fear and internalized prejudice against gay and queer people. And then when they start realizing, oh my gosh, maybe that's me, mm-hmm. that's the first hurdle is admitting it and then being able to allow yourself to still feel loved. Is Was that your yeah. experience as well? Yeah, for me, it was just this overwhelming sense of disbelief and fear because now all of a sudden all of these narratives that I had internalized now had reflected back upon me and now applied to me. And Mm -hmm. like I said, the narratives that I had internalized was that gay people go to hell. And now all of a sudden I go to hell. Mm -hmm. I can't even describe how terrifying of a thought that was. And it just threw my entire faith into chaos and, you know, this overwhelming fear that I was going to be one of those people that arrive at the gates of heaven um, who say, Lord, Lord, did I not do all these things in your name? And Jesus says to me, um, depart from me. I never Mm -hmm. knew you. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, that's going to be me. I am going to, like, I've been in the church my whole life. I have called upon Jesus my whole life, but I am gay. And Jesus is going to say to me at the end of all of it, depart from me. I never knew you. That was like just this overwhelming fear because like, I have this thing about me that is so inherently sinful. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's, that's what happens, you know, when these, uh, these messages in the culture, it's very common for marginalized people to internalize those narratives about themselves and to believe them about themselves. And so you develop this kind of self-hatred for yourself and you really think that you are this terrible person um, that you have been made to believe you are by all of the messaging that exists. And it's, it's honestly, for me, it almost destroyed my faith altogether because, you know, if nothing that I do is going to make Jesus want me, because I am a vessel of wrath that has mm-hmm. been prepared for destruction before the beginning of time, then what's the point of following him? And so, yeah, it's it was a very terrifying place to be in, very confusing, that you know really left me in a bad spiritual place, mm-hmm. to say the least. How long did you carry that alone? Um. <sighs> That's like really hard to say. I think it probably reached a climax over like a period of, you know, two years or so. During college, I was kind of very much in denial and not really even allowing myself to really think about it a ton. And, you know, Mm -hmm. sometimes I would think about it, but I would just kind of push it away and store it somewhere, compartmentalize, not really deal with it. But after college, that was when I really started needing to wrestle with it because now I'm looking at my life and needing to think about how I was going to live and, Mm -hmm. you know, how I was going to, I guess, live in relationship. Am I going to be alone for the rest of my life? Things like that. And that was when it's really started to kind of reach a climax. And I would say for probably a good two years, I was in that place and really struggling to resolve a lot of the tensions that I had. And I think for me, what really was a breaking point, I don't don't know if breaking point is the right, but like a turning point there. Mm -hmm. What was a turning point for me was, you know, I I had reached a place where I was just so terrified. I legitimately stayed up for an entire night afraid to go to sleep because I feared opening my eyes in the fires of hell. Uh, Like I would go to sleep and God was going to destroy me and I would wake up in hell. And I was just in that place of being so scared. And I guess the Holy Spirit really spoke to me in that. And it was kind of almost like this war between the Holy Spirit on one hand and the enemy on the other. And I was uh, hearing almost like audibly in my mind as I was wrestling, just like this voice telling me, God hates you. God doesn't want you. You are condemned. You are damned. Nothing you do can make God love you. Just like this kind of message over and over again. And in that moment, I decided to pray. And so I started praying to God and the Holy Spirit kind of spoke through that, you know, voice of death um, and spoke the truth of the gospel that I am God's child, that he loves me, that nothing can separate me from him. Nothing, including my sexuality, can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. Me being gay is not a source of division between me and God's love. Not even that can separate me from him. And that, I guess, was the turning point 
being brought back to that verse in the Bible and realizing that my sexuality was included in this, that nothing can separate me. And that included the fact that I was gay Um, and just realizing that I had been lied to. Um, And those, the lies that I had been fed had perverted, had twisted the message of the gospel in my life. did you come out? Where were you? How old were you? Was it a small group of people? I mean, I found you on Twitter as a celibate gay person. So yeah. like, wh- how did you get from point A to point B there? I actually did not ever really come out myself, like have a voluntary coming out moment. Um, you know, a lot of times people see coming out as like, you know, the gay person goes to their parents and like declares this thing, Mm -hmm. you know, posts on Facebook, I am gay, you know, those types of things. And I never really had that moment. I actually had decided that I was never going to talk about this with anyone, uh, that this was going to be my secret that I took to the grave that Mm -hmm. no one would ever know about me. Um, I would just keep it hidden, buried, because I knew how bad of a thing it was. And I knew how people were treated that were like me. And I was like, I am not going to let that happen to me. I am just never going to come out. Um, But after college, I discovered that not coming out, that trying to hide my sexuality wasn't necessarily an option. After college, I really started setting people's gaydar off and people started asking questions, started wanting to know, you know, if I was into girls and, you know, I was in my very conservative church that I was in. And so they were prying in order to find out if I was living in sin or not. Mm -hmm. And so of course I would deny it. At one point, my pastor brought me into a meeting and actually just asked me point blank, are you gay. And I like immediately denied it. I was like, no way, not doing it. No, that's not, that's not me. But, and I was out at the time to one very close friend and that was the only person I was out to. And around that time I came out to one other friend who was actually not very close to me, but kind of just like testing the waters. A lot of times that's what you do. You Mm -hmm. come out to people that are a little bit distant from you first, because if they reject you, that's going to hurt less. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I came out to her and um, she immediately went to the pastor at my church and told him. Um, And then it wound up being this whole big to do getting pulled into meetings, you know, rules that I suddenly had to follow and, you know, sins that have, have I committed? No, I haven't, but are you sure? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people talking behind my back and, you know, saying things, you know, gossip. So it it was not the best experience um, and not something that I was actually looking to have, not something that I asked for, but, you know, it was what it was. And I guess that was the beginning of pushing me out because I had been brought out and I found that I no longer had a choice but to talk about this in order Mm -hmm. to reclaim the narrative, in order to correct what people were saying about me. Um, And so I guess that was was my coming out process. How much later was that from when you, you know, you're afraid to go to sleep at night and then you realize, wait, nothing can separate me. What what was going on with your internal faith to this external experience? Where, Where were those lining up at? That was all, it was all happening in the same time period. Yeah. Um, And that was when, because I had been getting pushed out, I found myself unable to keep pushing it down Mm -hmm. and putting it in a corner where I kind of just don't deal with it. Because it was being pushed out, I was finding myself in a situation where I had to start thinking about it, um, where 
I no longer could avoid it, which was, I guess, what brought me to that, you know, place of just real crisis in my faith because it was just all coming to a head. I assume you left that community pretty quickly or did you try and stick it out? I did not. Um, I really had this perspective of you have to stay with your church in order to be a faithful Christian. Um, You have to be faithful to the local church, Mm -hmm. um, to your local church, that if you leave a, a church over some kind of dispute or, you know, something that you dislike, that that is a sign that you are not being faithful as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed for five years with that church. Right. Um, And finally, five years into it, I was like, I, I really started realizing that this was not a healthy mindset and that it was time for me to go. Why are you still a Christian? Why are you part of this community who has struggled so hard with, I mean, for, for you, sexuality and your gender, right? Has struggled to mm-hmm. empower women and has struggled to accept gay and queer people into its fold. Yeah. Why stay? For me, it's Jesus, the gospel, the message that God loves us, that God not only loves us as a collective, but also loves me. And that God was willing to do whatever it takes to fix this mess that we've made for ourselves in the world up to sacrificing his very life. Just the gospel message that I am treasured and loved just is what keeps me in the faith. I think that it's beautiful and it also is the truest thing that I have found. And, you know, it is such a compelling truth to me. And, you know, I can't abandon that. I can't let go of that. And it breaks my heart when I see it twisted, when I see it perverted, especially by God's people. I think it is the most precious thing in the world and needs to be the the message of which needs to be preserved for others. And, Um, authentically and accurately presented to others because when it's twisted and its its message is used to communicate um, judgment and condemnation upon the world, I just, I think it's the the greatest tragedy. Um, And so for me, remaining in the faith, um, staying committed to the faith is like the most natural thing to me because it was you know, God's people wandering from the gospel that did the most damage to me. And so I truly believe that returning to the gospel, returning to the fundamentals of what it means to be in Christ is what will prevent all of the harm that takes place in the church um, because ultimately it all kind of ripples out from there. And obviously there's, you know, it's more complicated to that. There's more, you know, to it. But I think, you know, when you get to the root, it's it's the gospel at the center that we need to hold on to um, in order to prevent these harms and abuses from happening. something else I'm going to ask every guest. How do you draw the line between influence and enabling? So you're, if you're, you're part of these communities that, you know, struggle with, with some of these issues, at what point are you just empowering them to continue to distort the gospel? And how do you know when you're there? And how do you know when you're helping them to restore the gospel? Yeah. So the way that I see it is um, enabling is being silent. It's not stepping up to bring change. It's not choosing to challenge others and the assumptions that they often make. It's speaking up 
when uh, things are said that are harmful to other people. I think enabling is all of those things. At the same time, I think enabling is also going in with guns blazing, angry and overbearing, arguing with people, making all these demands right up front. Um, I think that's also enabling. And I don't think this often gets uh, named because when you go in angry and overbearing and argumentative and that shuts people off, Mm -hmm. that that makes people dig in. That honestly just makes them worse than before you went in. You're just making things worse. And so uh, enabling is at once being silent, but it's also being too loud. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because when you are too loud, when you are too overbearing, too argumentative, that pushes people further in to their harmful position, causes them to dig in. And so, you know, it's important not to do either. And so for me, the way I see it is influencing churches looks like challenging other people to think about what they believe, to consider other perspectives, to not necessarily take for granted the assumptions that they have. Um, I think influencing churches looks like speaking up when Mm -hmm. harmful things are said, um, suggesting change, taking initiative to bring about those changes. And uh, alongside that, I also think it looks like being strategic, understanding where people are at, and realizing that if you come in with too many things to address, none of it is going to get addressed. Mm -hmm. People don't go from A to Z by skipping all the letters of the alphabet. Like, you know, they got to go from one step to the next to the next. Um, and so it, it, for me, it took me years to come to terms with my sexuality um, and I'm gay. And so it will also take other people time. And so I think having influence in the church is at once speaking up, speaking out, challenging people's perspectives, but also knowing which hills to die on and which ones to save for another day right. for the sake of bringing people along. Because if we don't have patience, if we don't have like a strategic mindset, then people are never going to move along at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's really important. And, you know, understanding that like queer people don't always necessarily have the energy or the capacity to do those things because We've been doing those things often for years Mm -hmm. and, you know, being really, really mistreated because we are queer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for queer people, there's often like just an inability to do that because we've run out of steam. Um, And so, you know, it really makes such a difference when non-queer people step in and like fill that gap and, uh, you know, take up a role of speaking out and challenging and and really seeking to bring change. That makes such a huge difference because oftentimes we don't have the capacity to do that anymore because right. we have just run ourselves dry. You are traditional in the way you interpret scripture, so you're, you're celibate. Mm-hmm. How would you define an ally as someone with that traditional interpretation? I think that is a tough question to answer when you come from a traditional perspective, Mm because there's always the fear that you are going to be legitimizing sin. Mm -hmm. But from uh, the way I see things, I think it's important to uh, affirm that LGBTQ people are equal heirs to the kingdom of God regardless of what they choose to believe about gender or sexuality, about same-sex marriage, celibacy, all of these things, regardless, that LGBTQ person has equal standing in the kingdom of God as you. Mm -hmm. And uh, their perspective on gender and sexuality deserves to be respected as a position that they have sought God's will on, that they have spent oftentimes years searching scripture on um, and comes from the same desire to submit to God's law as yours does. Mm -hmm. And also speaking out to defend Mm -hmm. their equal standing in the church because oftentimes they are not treated that way. 
So you've written a book with the purpose of helping people in the church, people within the church uh, grapple with some of these issues, some of the harm that, that have been caused, some of the dangers for gay people. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that book is? So my book is called Heavy Burdens, Seven Ways LGBTQ Christians Experience Harm in the Church. And in the book, I go through the ways that LGBTQ people are discriminated against, and I name seven big overarching themes, um, and I unpack them and the reasons for them and how they manifest I share very personal stories from LGBTQ people that I know and things that have happened to them in their lives. At the end of the book, I kind of review um, everything that we talked about and I walk through some suggestions for creating a healthier church for LGBTQ people. And so my book is really designed to kind of help people understand what it's like to be queer in the church. And instead of having the magnifying lens on queer people and like, you know, debating whether same-sex marriage is biblical or not and all Mm -hmm. of these questions. I take the magnifying lens and I put it back on the church and I uh, seek to really walk through and, and think through the problems that exist in the church. Instead of having the magnifying lens on LGBTQ people, I turn it back on us, the church, Mm -hmm. Christians. And I ask the church to kind of examine its own position, its own assumptions and the, and the contributions it has made to lasting trauma and what it needs to do um, in order to bring change. Uh, And so that's my book. And I guess my hope for it is that it can really create a healthier church for LGBTQ people where they can thrive spiritually. Why I Stay is a production of the Pathios Podcast Network, where we explore faith and gain understanding. If you enjoyed today's episode, please go to Spotify or Apple or wherever you're listening to this podcast, leave us five-star review, and share some thoughts about why you like this. Every review really helps it grow. I really liked my conversation with Bridget. She occupies a rare and difficult space in today's religious landscape. She's not ashamed of her sexuality, yet she follows her conscience and stays celibate. And whatever our views are on sexuality, whether traditional or not, there's a lot to learn from Bridget's humility and dedication. Check the show notes for links to buy her book, Heavy Burdens, and for her social accounts. Why I Stay is edited and mastered by Clinton Battles, and it was produced and hosted by me, John Osborne.